Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Robert Harms, the Henry J. Hines Professor of History and African Studies at Yale. Professor Harms is the author of The Diligent, A Voyage Through the Worlds of the Slave Trade, which has won numerous prestigious awards. He has also written two books on the history of equatorial Africa, River of Wealth, River of Sorrow, the Central Zaire Basin in the Era of the Slave and Ivory Trade, and Games Against Nature, an Eco-Cultural History of the Nunu of Equatorial Africa. Today we'll talk with Professor Harms about his newest endeavor, a book called The Imperialists and the Slave Trader, Conflict, Collaboration, and the Making of Colonialism in Equatorial Africa, 1874 to 1905. Welcome, Professor Harms. Glad to be here. So what is the premise of The Imperialists and the Slave Trader? Well, the book is set during the scramble for Africa in the late 19th century. And that's a time when all the major powers of Europe were more or less tripping over each other to try to lay claim to the resources and territories of Africa. And the scramble for Africa has previously been looked at almost always at a macro level, where you look at the strategies of the great powers and empires and plots of empire building and competition among the European powers. And I want to reverse it and look at it at a micro level, focusing on people who were on the ground in Africa and the premise is that often in this early period, events in Africa itself on the ground were driving the process, and the European uh, powers would make decisions that would follow in the wake of the African events themselves. Okay, so tell us what the book is about. Well, the book focuses on the Congo River Basin, which is equatorial Africa. And in 1875, the whole Congo River Basin was entirely unknown territory to the Europeans they didn't even know where the Congo River went. Mm -hmm. 30 years later, by 1905, uh, the whole territory had been colonized, part of it by the Belgians and part of it by the French. And by 1905, two explosive uh, international reports came out showing that the Belgian and French Congos were the most heavily and massively and brutally exploited parts of all of Africa. So the main narrative then is how did it go from uh, terra incognita in 1875 to the most heavily exploited part of Africa in 1905. And in order to tell that story, I focus on three characters who were both explorers and empire builders in their own right. And the first is Henry Morton Stanley, born in Wales, became an American citizen, ended up working for King Leopold II of Belgium to create the uh, Congo Free State, which later became the Belgian Congo. The second one was uh, Pierre Savignon de Brazza, who's an Italian who worked for the French. And he then created French Equatorial Africa. And the third character is an African, uh, an Afro-Arab slave trader named Hamad bin Mohammed, but known to everybody as Tipu Tip. And he created a large uh, slave and ivory trading empire in the Eastern Congo. And this was a territory that Henry Morton Stanley and King Leopold heavily coveted throughout uh, the years of the book. And so the idea of the narrative is that if you look at the way these three characters sometimes collaborated with one another, sometimes had bitter fights with one another, and through this pattern of conflict and collaboration emerged the earliest structures of colonialism in equatorial Africa. Okay, so how did you come to write the book? Was the idea born out of the research you did for the diligent? Well, my first experience in Africa was teaching in a high school in eastern Congo, right in the middle of the territory where Tipu Tib's empire mm -hmm. once existed. So I've known about Tipu Tib for my whole career and been interested in him. Then when I was in graduate school, I did some research on the rubber atrocities in the Belgian Congo mm -hmm. uh, in the early cl colonial period. And this book is a way to put those two interests together because in a very indirect way that the exploitation done by Tipu Tib later on got replaced by the exploitation done by Stanley's empire that he creates working for King Leopold. And so one can trace a direct line uh, from the one kind of exploitation to the other. And uh, so that made the process attractive. Mm -hmm. But there is actually a connection with the diligent, very indirect, mm -hmm. which is when the diligent came out and was being reviewed, one of the reviewers said, well, 
you know, a lot of scrutiny has been put onto the Atlantic slave trade and the European slave traders, but he said, but no similar scrutiny has been uh, put to the Arab slave traders uh, in equatorial Africa in the 19th century. And he, said, and he especially named Tipu Tip. He said, nobody has scrutinized Tipu Tip as much as uh, Robert Harms scrutinized the people on the diligence. So uh, that's not the reason I'm writing the book, but once it's out, I could call up that reviewer and say, See, I scrutinized Tipu Tip too. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that when I was reading the book, I was fascinated by that aspect of it because I had never, um, I was not aware that Africans uh, basically took advantage of other Africans. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. So how did you do the research for the book? Well, this is all based on archives. And uh, the good part about the research is that I get to travel to interesting places. Mm -hmm. And the the papers relating to Tipu Tip are mostly on the island of Zanzibar off the east coast of Africa. And when I spent the summer before last in Zanzibar, I rented an apartment. And the apartment in, in the building that I was renting was about 20 feet away from the house, the huge mansion that Tipu Tip had built in the uh, 1890s in Zanzibar, so that Tipu Tip was my neighbor for the mm -hmm. whole summer. And did you plan it that way, or was it no, serendipity? No, I, I just found out wow. after I got there. Mm -hmm. I'd rented the apartment through email contacts, and uh, when I got there, somebody pointed out that the house right next door was the one built by Tipu Tip. So, that, so the Tipu Tip's papers are in Zanzibar. Mm -hmm. Now, Henry Morton Stanley's papers were in private hands for most of this century, until recently they were sold by the Stanley family to the Royal Museum for Central Africa in Tiver in Belgium. It took them about a dozen years to get them inventoried, but now, starting about three or four years ago, they became available to the public. I'll be one of the first people using uh, the Stanley papers. Mm -hmm. uh, Braz's papers are in Aix-en-Provence in southern France. Uh, and th those papers have been there a long time and been inventoried, but it's recently come to light that some of the most important, uh, especially reports about the early, uh, the later part of his life and surrounding his death, which had been thought to be lost for years, uh, might not be lost at all. And I'll be going back there uh, over Christmas break to see what I can find. Wow, that must be very exciting for you. Um, do you have any ideas of, of what you might uncover? Or what well, would be a surprise? Well, uh, what I'm looking for is that I mentioned that in 1905, a report came out about atrocities in the Belgian Congo and another report about atrocities in the French Congo. Mm -hmm. And the commission that reported on the atrocities in the French Congo uh, was headed by Braza, and he died on the, sh on the way home from Africa. And the whole report that he was writing and that his fellow commission members were writing were all re repressed. Uh, and then another commission was appointed which wrote a sort of a whitewash type report. Mm -hmm. But all of the original report notes and uh, drafts were never found. But I ran across a reference recently to somebody who had actually seen them in the, in the 1970s mm. uh, in a box in the French archives. Wow. And so uh, I'm going to try to see if I could find that box. Okay, well good luck with that. Um, your book highlights several underdeveloped themes in the history of early colonialism. Um, talk about some of them. Well, first of all, I'm putting the events in the context of the globalization of the late 19th century, mm -hmm. when a lot of African products that had not been seen as all that valuable on the world market suddenly became seen as valuable and crucial. And two of these products that affected equatorial Africa were ivory and rubber. Mm -hmm. And one connection to us here in Connecticut is that one of the major destinations for the ivory uh, coming out of equatorial Africa was Ivoryton, Connecticut, oh. where the tusks were made into piano keys and billiard balls all of which graced uh, the homes of the rising American bourgeoisie. So uh, when somebody shoots an elephant and takes the tusk, you know, it's related to a form of globalization, it's a, related to a form of uh, economic development in the United States, and so there are worldwide connections mm -hmm. to all of these uh, events. A second theme has to do with the African empire builders, because most studies of the scramble for Africa focus on the European empire builders, mm -hmm. 
And what they've forgotten is that as certain African commodities are becoming more valuable on the world market, there are a lot of Africans who are jumping into the game and wanting to build their own empires and uh, corner the market on those commodities. Mm -hmm. And Tipu Tib was one of those, and that's why I make him one of the central characters uh, of the story. Mm -hmm. And then a third theme has to do with the, the Arab and Swahili slave trade that brought slaves out of equatorial Africa towards Zanzibar and distributed them around the, the Indian Ocean. And when people talk about the scramble for Africa, they often focus on the economic motives of the Europeans, the strategic motives of the Europeans. But what they forget is that there was a huge anti-slavery campaign going on in, in Europe at the time against the Arab slave okay. trade. And that was the big humanitarian cause of its decade. And the irony is that it was this campaign against the Arab slave trade in Europe that helped drum up uh, public opinion in Europe for colonialism. Okay. And the fourth theme, finally, is just to capture a sense of the time and the place. Because mm -hmm. when we look back at that period today, it seemed inevitable that the Europeans would win out and end up taking over Africa. But for people who were in the ground at the time, it wasn't at all inevitable. And this was a very wide open period when a penniless adventure could become a potentate. And uh, everything seemed wide open and chaotic. And I want to capture that sense of opportunity and chaos that existed for the people at the time. Okay, um, so are there any historical lessons that we can perhaps take from your book and apply them today? Well, this Africa in the 1870s was a very different okay. place than it is today and we're now uh, over a century later, but there is one cautionary tale that comes out of the book and that that is that the humanitarians in Europe who were organizing rallies against the Arab slave trade uh, in equatorial Africa ended up creating the circumstances which allowed uh, to gain public support for colonial adventures which ended up creating a, a form of colonialism that was every bit as brutal as the situation created by the, the Arab slave traders. Mm -hmm. And one example is King Leopold of the Congo, who was Henry Morton Stanley's boss. At one point, he organized a big international conference to whip up international support against the Arab slave trade. During that conference, he appoints Tipu Tib, who was the biggest Arab slave trader of them all, to be his governor of the Eastern Congo. Uh, and so uh, what happens is the humanitarians were extremely sincere but they got hopelessly outmaneuvered by the cynical okay. empire builders. Okay. And what is the most surprising thing you found in doing your research? Well, in focusing on my three character, main characters, mm -hmm. one thing that came to me is that they all had very chameleon-like personalities. Stanley was born in, in Wales, came to America, fought on both sides of the Civil War, uh, went to Africa working for the New York Herald to find David Livingston, then got hired by uh, uh, King Leopold of the Belgians to create the Congo Free State. Mm -hmm. And then he was later a member of parliament in Britain. So wow. he had a lot of different identities exactly. during his lifetime. Quite the career. Uh, Brazza was an Italian who worked for the French and ended up being buried in Algeria after his death. About three years ago, his body was moved to Brazzaville in the Congo, which is the city, of course, named after him. Uh, the third character, Tipu Tib, uh, had Arab, Om Omani Arab ancestors and uh, Nyamwezi African ancestors, and he was sometimes an Arab or sometimes an African, uh, depending on who was asking. So my feeling is that in that period when everything was wide open and in flux, and there were really no states that could impose any kind of state-like order on things, uh, it was these people with the chameleon-like personalities who survived. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it sounds very fascinating. Um, thank you very much for being with us here today and sharing some of your work. I enjoyed it. For more information about Professor Harms and his work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.